speakers. Our first speaker, Vittorio Giragini, is a postdoc here at CFA. He's been here since um, 2018, working with Ezra Bobo. He got his bachelor's and master's degrees in physics at the University of Trento in Italy. And then he got his PhD in astrophysics at the University of Bologna, working with Stefano Eiffel. Um, his interests are primarily in galaxy clusters, using X-ray and the sea observations. And today he's going to be telling us about joint Chandra and XMM analysis of high redshift SPT selected clusters. So, hello everyone, I'm Fabio and I'm going now to present you some preliminary results I've been doing in the recent months with Ezra about a sample of a Z-selected cluster using the South Coast Telescope, Telescope or SPT. So, I will be talking about galaxy clusters, so I'll first briefly introduce galaxy clusters. So, galaxy clusters are the most massive and the largest bound structures that we can find in the universe. These are very massive, in fact the masses are between 10 to the 14 and 10 to the 15 solar masses. Moreover, they have a very large physical size on the order of about 1 to 3 megaparts, I mean, let's say, megaparts scale in order. According to the hierarchical scenario of structure formation, galaxy clusters are the latest product, the latest realized product of structure formation, and in fact they typically have formed at ratio below 2. Moreover, being galaxy cluster, it is large and uh, massive, or at least on the large scale, they are expected to be dominated by gravity, and thus galaxy cluster can be used as very powerful cosmological probe. Moreover, galaxy cluster contain a lot of interesting astrophysical phenomena, and so cluster can also be used as true astrophysical laboratories. From an observational point of view, galaxy clusters were first discovered as overdensity in galaxy distribution. And as you can see here in the top right, top left image, you see an image of the Sloan's Digital Sky Survey of the Kuma cluster. And it's clear that there are overdensity of, gal of galaxies there. And so galaxy clusters were first discovered as overdensity in galaxy distribution. However, galaxy is only, or stars in general, are only a small fraction of the total baryonic content in galaxy cluster. The majority of the baryons, in fact, are in the form of a hot and diffuse medium, which is called the intercluster medium, or ICM. In particular, it's very hot because its temperature is about 10 to the 7 on 10 to the, 10 to the 6 on 10 to the 7 Kelvin, and thus it's emitting X-ray in the, in the KV band. And moreover, galaxy clusters are very diffuse because they're Particle density is between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 2 particle per centimeter squared. However, if you sum up all the baryonic content that you see in galaxy cluster, you only reach about 20%, and the majority of matter content in galaxy cluster is in the form of, uh, of dark matter. And one thing that I forgot to say is that the intercluster medium is also responsible for a distortion that can be seen in the microwave on the cosmic microwave background, and so cluster of galaxies can be observed also in the microwave wavelength by probes like SPT or Planck, as you can see in this top right plot here. So now I'm going to present you the sample that I, I have studied in the last few months. So basically this sample has been selected from the South Coast Telescope cluster catalog such that these clusters are the clusters with the highest signal-to-noise ratio, so signal-to-noise above SIG is the criteria, and also are the clusters which are the first clusters that are formed in the universe, meaning that the redshift of this object is above 1.25, which is quite a lot of time ago. Moreover, this project has been possible only thanks to the effort of several people, as listed here, which in total have uh, obtained more than two megaseconds of observing time with both Chandra and XMM. In particular, about 1.3 megasecond with Chandra and 0.7 megasecond with XMM. Here you see a list of clusters and a list of redshift and some properties like position and exposure time. And basically, the goal of this project is to study the thermodynamic properties of the first clusters that are formed in the universe see how much they differ from the cluster that we observe nowadays in the very local universe, 
and try to connect how the first clusters that we can observe um, evolve to become the cluster that we see nowadays. So one first imp important properties of these objects is that they are very small on the plane of the sky. In fact, here you see a direct comparison of the physical size of uh, a high redshift cluster, this object here, and a cluster uh, able to maintain at very low redshift. And you can clearly see that, as, ob as it is almost obvious, that clusters at high redshift are very small. This is just to say that at this redshift, correcting properly for the instrumental point spread, point spread function, or PSF, is very important to get the correct thermodynamic properties of these objects. So, one first measurement we, that we did is to get simply the redshift from an ICM measurement for this object. In particular, you can get the redshift by measuring the position of the iron K alpha line, which is, has a rest frame of uh, 6.7 keV, which is redshifted depending on the redshift on the clusters. And we compare the value we get out of this analysis with spectroscopic and photometric redshift that we get out of uh, other studies, optical studies, typically. With what you can see is that, in general, the redshift that I've measured, so these blue points here, agree quite well with uh, the redshift measured in, uh, in other way, so in spect spectroscopic and photometric redshifts. There is only a slight difference here, which seems to indicate some kind of tension for this object, uh, 20, uh, SPT cluster uh, 2241. But if we measure the position of the iron key alpha line as measured by the ICM, and we compare with the position of the iron key alpha line which is predicted to, wh where it's predicted to be located by the spectroscopic crash shift, we get that the difference between the, the one that is observed and the one that is predicted using this spectroscopic crash shift is only a difference of about 60 electron volt, and so it's well below the energy resolution of XMM, for instance, at the posi energy position of the iron key alpha line. So even there seems to be some kind of conflict there, there is actually none because we are below the... Uh, spectral energy resolution of XMM. This is a typical image that we see for this object. When you can see on the left, you see a Chandra image, and on the right, you see the XMM image. And you immediately see how these two telescopes are different. Keep in mind that the two observations, both for XMM and Chandra, have about, have about more or less the same exposure time. And, immediate, and the colors the color scale that is, is used to show this picture is the same for both Sun and XMM. Mm -hmm. And what you see immediately is that XMM has a much larger effective area, and thus you are able to detect many more photons in the XMM image. However, you also see the effect of the XMM PSF, which smears out the location and the energy of the point sources that contaminate your field of view. Like you see that this isn't the same physical scale, you see that here you have three Chandra sources, three, so three sources detected by Chandra, while XMM detects only one, basically blends in several point sources, and does, and, and also these point sources contaminate a much larger area of your detectors. And so, it's important also to have both XMM, XMM and Chandra because of the large effective area that you have in XMM, but also you need the spatial resolution of Chandra to properly detect point sources and structures that you can see in these objects. <coughs> then, one thing that observers do is simply taking a surface brightness profile, which simply means starting from the center of the cluster and in annular region counts how many photons you have, measure how large <coughs> these regions are in a minus square, so measure the area, and also ha count by how much time these clusters have, I mean, the cluster has been observed in that annuli, and then by simply dividing the number of photons by the, by the area and by, by the exposure time, you get a surface brightness profile. To get the density profile for this object, we know that the X-ray emissivity in a given energy band strongly depends on the density, is directly dependent on the density, and so, if we take any given density model, 
we project it on the pain, we project it on the pane of the sky and then we convolve with the properties of the instrument, then taking into account response of the instrument, effective area, and PSF, we get a pre and then we multiply this value by the by the total exposure time and by the area, we get a direct prediction of the number of counts that should be observed in a given annuli, given the exposure time and given the area and the instrument. And so by using a Poisson log likelihood, we can compare the number of counts that are actually observed with the one that are predicted by a given model. And then we can maximize the likely, this likelihood by marginalizing over the model parameters in order to get what is the best uh, density profile that represents this cluster. This is illustrated in this figure here, when you have your surface brightness profile in Chandra on the left and XMM on the right, shown in both cases with red points. The cluster density model is shown by this curved here, this black curve here, to which we have to add a constant, which represents the cosmic X-ray background, or CXB. And then, by convolving this model with the response and the effective area and the PSF, we get this blue line, which fits very well the observed surface brightness profile, as you can see also from the bottom panel where I plot the residual. And I particularly want to point out that I add up the log likelihood of both Chandra and XMM, such that at the same time, this model fits both Chandra and XMM images directly. So summarizing briefly this, from the Chandra XMM images, I, I am able to derive the best fitting density profile given both Chandra and XMM observed images. So for the temperature instead, we don't really, we are not really able to measure temperature from Chandra because there are only a couple thousand, a couple hundreds of photons that are detected using uh, Chandra in several, in the annual, in these, for these objects. However, XMM, thanks to this large effective area, is able to detect about some thou few thousands of photons and does, we're able to get temperature profiles in four radial binning. In the case of the temperature, we directly get, we get directly correct for the instrumental PSF um, by considering the cross talk between each couple of um, annuli in which we have from which we have extracted the spectra, which in practice means using this cross region arc parameter in the FGen in the FGen um, XMM task to get this kind of effective area, and then including this as a, an extra model in expect an extra model for each couple of uh, annuli to directly correct all the, all the XMN temperature at the same time. And so the red point that you see here is the two-dimensional spectral temperature profile already corrected by the PSF using this cross-region R parameter. For the case of the temperature, we also start from a 3D temperature model. And then this model is also projected on the plane of the sky and then is weighted in each bin because the spectral temperature is predicted to be to be the one you observe is predicted to be emission weighted and also with a correction which depends on the spectral shape of this object and what you get if you start from this kind of blue 3D temperature profile you project and you fit to the to the spectral temperature measured and the best fit is shown by this green point so now that we have recovered for all of these objects density and temperature profiles we can directly pl plug in the value we get inside the static equilibrium equation to directly get a mass profile and does the total mass of these objects. And here, in this plot here, I show for, e for each one of these objects the mass reconstruction I'm able to get for each one of these systems. You see my results in green and blue while I comparing with the red points, the red uh, diamonds, and this black point, which are values that are found in the literature for these, uh, these objects. However, I would like to remind you that the values that are found in the literature for these objects come from scaling relation. So from, in the case of uh, these red points, applying the scaling relation, which links the 
SPT signal to noise ratio to the mass. And in the case of the black point of the 2017 result, he's, made, he's estimating the mass using the M gas M total scaling relation. And so what I want to say with that is simply the fact that these are the first hydrostatic measurement for a static mass measurement for these objects. And as you can see, you have cases where the error bars are very large and cases where the error bars are smaller. This depends basically on the kind of data quality we have. In particular, the first two objects have point sources that contaminate the central part of the field of view and therefore you don't have, don't have a lot of photons to constrain the temperature and then and thus, given the fact that temperature is directly the temperature is directly correlated to the mass the other a measurement an, an uncertainty on the temperature measurement strictly becomes an error on the measured mass in general however you see that the value i am able to recover do I agree within one or two sigma in general with the major with the measured value in the literature with one particular case here when there is like three sigma discrepancy more or less with the values that f are found using scaling relations and this could possibly indicate that the fact that this object does not fall exactly on a given scaling relation. So now that we have the thermodynamic properties and we have the masses, we can rescale the thermodynamic profiles according to some quantities. We do this because we have a model which is the so-called self-similar model of cluster formation and evolution that predicts that clusters should have the same thermodynamic quantities once you rescale your thermodynamic profiles according to quantities that depend on either redshift or, uh, or the mass. And in particular, the density should be evolving like a rock critical, and rock critical depends on this function of the square, which depends on, uh, on, uh, on the redshift here. And also, the radius should be rescaled by a value which is mass dependent, so it's the radius which depends on the mass to one third. One thing you observe immediately is the fact how, if you look at large radii, you have that your profile are well distributed around the profiles of an, a low redshift sample, which is shown here by the black line. And I have to mention briefly that this sample, XCOP, is, um, is a sample which has been selected using Planck single noise ratio, so still an SD probe, but these clusters are at redshift quite smaller. There are than this one, so the, the clusters in XCOP have redshift below 0.1. And moreover, also for XCOP, the masses have been computed using hydrostatic, by solving hydrostatic equilibrium equation, and so both of these uh, samples have been rescaled according to the same quantities, I mean, to the, to the quantities cal computed in the same way. And as you can see, in the outskirts, you have your profile well distributed around <laughs> these low redshift samples, but if you go in the core, you see that the density profile for high redshift objects are quite a lot, quite a bit below the density profile for uh, low redshift objects by more or less one of their magnitude, let's say. And moreover, you see another important property that typically clusters show, which is the fact that in the core you have a, quite a bit of scatter. Then the scatter decreases when you go to, toward the outer part, which is a minimum at a value which is about 0.3.4 in units of R500, and then the scatter increases again in the outer part. We try to model how the slope changes with radius by fitting this profile at high redshift using power loss in several radial ranges in order to obtain in each other ranges the value of the slope and the value of the scatter with respect to low redshift samples and what we obtain it's shown shown here by the red points where you see that the, as you have seen in the previous slide the density for high redshift object is much more it's much flatter than the redshift for low redshift object while in the outer part you have more or less the same slope and on the other hand if you look at the scatter you have basically the scatter for high and low redshift clusters is one on top of each other in the inner part, while in the outer part you have that the scatter increases much more steeply for uh, high redshift clusters. 
One other thing you can do is like measure in radius in several radial ranges what is the change of the normalization of the density between what is the prediction so from the self-similar model and what is observed. In fact, the self-similar model predicts that density should evolve like this uh, function squared. And we try to see whether there is an extra term at uh, the exponent to try to find uh, a possible evolution in the normalization of the density profiles. And what we find is, as already shown in a previous work by Medona 2017, is the fact that in the outer part, we are very close, we are consistent with the prediction from self-similar models. So like the outskirts of galaxy clusters evolve self-similarly. However, in the core, you have that the density profile has an evolution, which is this two plus, uh, this value is almost zero, which indicates the fact that the core of clusters are already set at high redshift. And this is already also proved by the fact that the scatter in the core is already set at high redshift. And so the physical properties that we found in cluster core are already set in the outskirts. On the other hand, no, in the core, however, on the other hand, in the outskirts, you have that you are on top of the self-similar prediction, but a much larger scatter, which is somewhat expected if you think about the fact that clusters at high redshift are creating a lot of matter along several different directions, and so probably the outskirts of clusters are not yet realized. And so you are self-similar on average, but you are not, well, you don't have a little scatter around it. You can do the same process for the temperature, but in, you can immediately see that for the temperature you have huge error bars, and you are basically consistent already here with the, with the temperature measured for low redshift samples. In fact, if you measure the slope in two radial beams and the scatter in the same two radial beams, you have that there are no indication of evolution in the temperature profiles from high redshift to low redshift, even though it's important to point out that the XMM point spread, fu point spread function forbids you to go within the first 15 arc seconds of uh, the cluster core, and thus the first point is not really problem in the core, but a, a part which is a bit farther out. And so, as I told you, the, the evolution, so the prediction of the evolution for the density should go like two thirds, and we get something which is a bit smaller, but still within a few sigma is consistent with uh, the self-similar expectation. However, on top of all of this, you have to add several systematics that really become to start to become dominant over what we are obtaining. So we have the presence of clumps, which basically clumps is are unresolved substructures that bias high your density profile and bias low your temperature, temperature measurement. And other works at low redshift have shown that the clamps should bias more or less a value of 5% at uh, F500 the density profile. And you, if you translate this value of bias on the density at F500, you have that the error bar that you only have from the increase in the error bars that you have only from the clamps is as large as the error bars that we are observing in the evolution for the density. And so b basically, this first systematic is already as large as the statistical. Moreover, you have that in the literature, there are several, there are several works like Schellenberger, Schellenberger 2015, which show that there is a, an offset between the channel XMM temperature profile. We try to see if that's the case also for these high redshift samples by measuring temperature prof a single temperature from both channel XMM and comparing the two in the same region uh, with the same first exclusion, etc. And we find that Chandler has a very large error bars because there are few photons, but still they are consistent with the value of XMM with a caveat, which is the fact that Chandra has central value of the preferred temperature, which tends to be about 20% higher than what XMM predicts you. So like temperature evolution is basically gone. And also you have like something that I'm going through right now is the fact that Several work have shown that if you choose the center in a different way than 
what I did. So basically what I did in this work is using the centroid on a somewhat larger aperture to capture the properties on a large scale for galaxy cluster. If you choose instead of that center, if you use the peak, the X-ray peak, we should be able to characterize maybe better the properties of the core. There are some work that find indication of evolution and some work who doesn't. So now I'm doing everything by changing the, my choice of the center and using the peak. And moreover, you have that a possible mass bias can mimic an evolution. Basically, this means that if you have a mass bias, for instance, in the case for the density, you will squeeze your profiles by, some, by, by almost the same quantity because you are uh, rescaling your radius by R500, which stri strictly depends on R500. And so you can have a bias caused by the fact that there is a mass I mean, you can have a, an evolution which is actually instead a mass bias. However, given the fact that the two clusters have the mass measured in the same way, there should not be too much bias between one to respect to the other one. Because if a bias affects, I mean, if there is a bias affecting the hydrostatic mass in one way, it can affect also the bias, the mass in the other way. However, we can try to see if still there is some residual difference between low redshift and high redshift uh, mass, mass measurement. So like try to see, we, so we try to fix the evolution in the outcrop to be really exactly self-similar. So like with the density evolving like E of Z squared. And we try to see whether a mass bias was necessary in order to make the two profiles agree. And what we find is that there should be a small mass bias. In fact, we find a value of 1 plus b, which is the usual notation for the mass bias of about 11%, but with a large uncertainty, which makes it consistent also with no mass bias at 3 sigma. But still, this is an, an extra uncertainty that you have to put on top of your really large error bars on all the previous plots. And so I leave you with my conclusions that and I will get you qu your questions. There is this point here that I put there, but I didn't mention because I don't have didn't have time. So basically, there are prediction of the cluster of the cluster mass evolution from redshift of 1.5, which is more or less the average redshift of this object, until redshift zero, which is more or less the redshift of XCOP. And in principle, these, the, um, this cluster should not be the progenitor of XCOP because the masses of this system, which are about three times 10 to the 14 should become system which have masses between one and two times 10 to the 15 at redshift zero, if this model is right. However, you still have the, and XCOP has masses typically lower than 10 to the 15, so not exactly the same mass. However, the self-similar prediction still tells you that the cluster uh, thermodynamic profiles should be the same if you rescale according to mass and some redshift properties. And so in principle, should not be a large effect. But still, it's there. There is this effect. If you had an X-ray telescope that had higher resolution even than Chandra and a bigger collecting area, uh, do you think that that would substantially change your conclusions, or would, would it not really help all that much? So, basically, for instance, for the density, will not change very much because Chandra has already a very nice spatial resolution. However, having a, a much larger effective area will help you really a lot in determining temperature profiles also for the core because XMM has the limit, a limitation of these of his PSF. So you can have temperature profiles below, below a 15 second radius. And for this object, 15 second is like 150 kiloparsecs. So it's like you are completely, you cannot really, co you cannot, co you cannot get the properties in the core. So having an instrument, I don't know, let's imagine links, that can, 
that get, can give, give you a much finer resolution in the core and also a large effective area can really give you temperature profiles on also in the core and thus will not only constrain even more the, the mass because you will basically have constraint from the core that here you don't have but you will also, also have to you can also get out of this temperature profiles in the core that at this redshift is not known and some simula I mean simulation it's very hard to know what simulation tells us about the core of this object but because it depends on the mixing of the properties of the mixing and etc but I want I don't want to get into that but yes the, the, the answer to your question is yes <laughs> Yeah, so a little bit of change of pace, and I don't get to have all the pretty pictures unless I steal from other people. Um, so, um, yeah, so all observatories these days are at some level concerned about what's the science impact of either their individual instruments, the whole observatory, whatever it may be, um, and Chandra is no different. Um, so in this talk, I'll cover a little background material about what exactly goes into scientific impact. Look at two recent studies that I've done using the Chandra bibliography. One is identifying high impact science papers, uh, since those are considered to be the papers that represent the most influential types of science coming from Chandra or any other observatory. And then I was curious about the demographics of thesis recipients whose work was based on Chandra data to see how they're doing in the field. Um, and then uh, to follow up how those queer inquiries and others, um, we've taken that information and tried to enhance data discoverability within the archive. So what do we need to take account of if we're looking for the scientific impact of an observatory? Well, from my point of view, we look at data sets, um, and we can group data in a number of ways, whether by instrument configuration, proposal, spatial alignment, uh, what have you. Um, those individual data sets can change over time, and relationships between the characteristics of the, of the uh, defining characteristics may also change with time, so you need to take that into account. Uh, the papers themselves, um, we spend a great deal of time within the archive linking the data, Chandra data that has been published in a paper to the paper and we pass that on to ADS, um, which allows a lot of these statistics to be done. Um, but a given paper, as you know, may cover multiple science topics uh, and a given paper may use data sets, multiple data sets, uh, partial data sets, both. Uh, it can get very complicated. Um, and then there's interactions between what's the evolution of both the uh, data sets and how papers are being written. Um, so we always have to ask ourselves for any given paper or set of papers, how much data for the science question being asked is available when the question was asked. Um, this most um, often shows itself in papers where they publish the first 500 kiloseconds and the second 500 kiloseconds isn't available for a year. So then you get the second paper that adds the two together. Should we actually count that as one paper? And if we do, what does that mean? Um, and then there's the, the secondary question of what significance does Chandra data play in the overall 
science objective of the paper. And this actually becomes quite important depending on what questions you're asking. So for instance, a very highly cited paper of um, the Fermi catalog used two Chandra observations just to give some x-ray characteristics of those two objects. But the paper was the Fermi catalog. It's kind of unfair to say that we should take full credit for it when we weren't providing that much science. <laughs> so uh, understanding those types of um, complexities, so why should you care about it? Um, one, many of you either have or will be, hopefully, uh, serving on observatory user committees or review panels and understanding these types of complexities will hopefully help you to ask um, more informed questions about what's going on with the observatory. Can also Understanding these can also aid in the articulation of scientific objectives for new missions in ways which can be measured later as to whether they were successful or not. Um, and it can also inform decisions on the requirements of the archive and bibliography services that would be needed in order to measure those scientific objectives. Um, and of course, funding agencies always want a number about this. Um, yay. <laughs> so why does the Chandra Archive care? Um, for us, metrics is always a secondary consideration. Um, our primary objective is data discovery. We want astronomers to be able to get to the data that they need um, and get all of the data that they need that we, that we have to offer. So we've used the bibliography studies and a number of other things to help guide the development of data discovery tools. And we're always questioning whether or not we're adequate, adequately serving the needs of the variety of users that are using our archival data. But we do have a, a set of metrics that we fall back on, or at least scripts to generate similar metrics. Um, that um, one set looks just at the specific characteristics of the observatory, so how well do long versus short programs uh, work, um, instrument configuration, the type of observation, the science topic, all of those types of things can you can get some idea. We always throw lots of caveats at whoever asks the question about how, how to use that, uh, how to interpret the data. Um, as I've mentioned before, we do have a variety of users of Chandra data. We have people doing multi-wavelength science where perhaps they've never, they're not x-ray experts, but they are trying to bring x-ray into their analysis. So we have users in that sense uh, with multi-wave band, we also have users um, who are more and more frequently doing data mining with the archive. They have different needs. Um, and then um, I just pointed out early career astronomers. Um, they may not know all the ins and outs of what to look for, how to interpret what's, what's available, and things like that. So we try to keep all that in mind when we're, when we're um, making our data public. And then uh, we also uh, need to highlight the scientific objectives of the mission, but we also need to showcase unexpected scientific results that um, no one, ex you know, some things are, no one expected Chandra to find it, but some things are just uh, synergies that people have. People are looking at data differently than they have in the past. So what are some of the facets of scientific impact? <clears throat> so one thing is all statistical studies need to account for the growth of your archive. You are always adding data to it, hopefully, unless you've been retired. Um, and whether the Chandra component is significant to the paper, I think that Fermi catalog. Um, some statistics are straightforward. When you're just looking at the body of publications, great. It's pretty much just adding up numbers and spitting it out. Um, binning it in whatever makes sense for the question. But there are more complex questions. Um, you have a number of statistics that need to assess the science impacts of, like I said, instrument configurations, time allotments for topical categories, a whole host of, of those types of relationships. And in those instances, you need to account for papers which include data for multiple bins. Um, 
you need to account for whether uh, the number of observations in one part of your category is the same as in another part of your category. Uh, for Chandra, this is the starkest example is ACES versus HRC. Well, you can't just say number of publications. The two instruments are used at very different rates. Um, so it, you really have to make sure that you understand um, the different categories that you're trying to divide your statistics into. And then there's a number of tangential questions that sort of always come into play or in the background somewhere. Um, we have to consider, is a given data set perhaps more valuable because it is able to be used by a wider portion of the astronomical community? Perhaps no one paper is the paper that's going to have the entire community looking at that piece of data. But there is that other component. How much of astronomy can benefit from it? Uh, another question that we often ask is whether there, what is the additional value of a data set because it is um, highly combined with data from other observatories? We just heard about um, XMM and Chandra looking at the same sources and how they complement each other. That's true of the other great observatories. But Chandra is also used with many, many ground-based observatories. And the fact that a number of observations are actually designed with that in mind, that, in my mind, adds significance to that, the value of that observatory or that uh, data set. And then, of course, the how much does Chandra play a part in the actual science of the paper? So the first uh, study that I did, and I started this several years ago, was looking for what we call these high-impact science papers. Uh, they're classically, almost every observatory just defines them as some set of the highest cited papers for the observatory. Most observatories will just give you a list of the top 50 to 100 papers, or some will say, I'll give you all the papers with more than X citations. And that's where it ends. Um, I tried that once, and somebody then went and looked at the papers, and they found that Fermi catalog <laughs> and said, wait a minute. <laughs> so one does have to take other things into account. Uh, the other problem with just using total citation counts is it tends to skew towards older papers. So you may not think of a paper as having high impact until it's 13 or 16 years old because it's been slowly accumulating uh, citations. Um, and the lower two plots in here give two examples of relatively old papers. Uh, one uh, took a while to get to um, over 200 citations, which is our nominal cutoff for large number of citations. Um, but it was a, a kind of a steady rate of accrual. While the second paper, um, I expect it to hit the, the uh, list for just uh, having enough um, a, a enough uh, citations on its own. But as you can see, early on, that paper seemed to be making a little bit of a splash, and then it slowly trickled out. That could be for any number of reasons, but that's a type of impact that we want to know about. It, it may not have... I don't even want to compare the, what types of impact, but it's definitely something that we would want to capture. So that's, a, that's another as, another aspect that we look at for the, the science, uh, the, the citation rates. But what's missing? Um, that subjective assessment of scientific contribution from Chandra. I actually did go through our top 200 papers and looked at every one, in, or, well, 165, and, deci and um, decided, on, gave, I gave myself some objective rules, wrote them down, that's what we apply everywhere. Um, and, was, and narrowed it down to 139 papers because some of those just really shouldn't count, not for high impact like this. Um, a secondary part is to, which we're just in the early stages of trying to figure out how to um, do this, is an assessment of the science topics in a paper. Uh, you can derive it from keywords, titles, and abstracts, but there's no uniform way of disambiguating one person's set of keywords from another. Uh, some people use the, the actual object's name rather than the class of object. So it, it, it can be quite complicated. Uh, I'm hoping some of the new features in um, ADS 
will help me uh, narrow some of this down because they're sort of um, combining those areas together and coming up with broad terms. Um, and another resource which is uh, really interesting is a unified astronomy thesaurus, which uh, more and more of the journals are going to start using for your keyword selection in your papers, so just a heads up. Um, over the years, I've discovered that it would have been better to make both of those assessments at the, when I first looked at the paper so that then I could just run my statistics uh, across um, different cuts of the papers and get an idea of how uh, citation rates might be different between different um, parts of this, the uh, astronomy community. I've been told a number of times in particular uh, that the supernova remnant community might be quite different from the AGN community when it comes to what journals they're published, how, what their citation rates are, different things like that. If I want to compare AGN papers to supernova remnant papers, I really need to take that into account. So the most recent study I've been looking at, though, was looking at uh, the theses that come out of Chandra. Um, every year, uh, I, I collect, we get uh, maybe eight or so theses added to the list. These are thesis, um, theses that have been based on Chandra data. Uh, for each of those, I collected a large number of, of uh, pieces of data. I looked at, I figured out the granting institutions and locations, advisors. Um, I assigned unique IDs to the recipients and the advisors so that I could do further linking with other data sets. Um, and proposal numbers for any data that were used in the thesis itself. And then I link the recipients and advisors to our proposal and peer review database because I have access to those as well. So what did I find out? So we have, uh, currently, we have 366 theses that um, have been based on Chandra data. The first one came out in 2000, so that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> Four of the PhD recipients have since advised students who then wrote Chandra theses. Um, we have a total of 287 unique advisors that I know of, um, and 55 of the recipients have listed more than one advisor. Um, surprisingly, 47 recipients don't list their advisors. I, I tend to think it's actually a cultural thing because they tend to be foreign non-U.S. Um, theses that, that ha where I have this problem. 61 advisors have supervised multiple thesis students, Chandra thesis students, and 12 of those advisors have um, actually advised four or more um, students. We have 113 theses granted from 20 countries outside of the U.S., so we're definitely uh, global. Um, and you can see uh, where the highest, not too surprising, where the highest uh, theses rates are coming from. Uh, we also have theses out of 38 states and 76 institutions within the U.S. And again, not too surprising about where the theses are, except for Ohio. I don't quite understand, but um, if, I'm sure there's obviously some team going on there, but don't know who they are. Um, one of our thesis recipients actually got both, did both a Chandra master's and PhD thesis. And at least two very major catalogs have um, been the result of the thesis that they did. Um, one being the, the uh, Chandra deep field cells two megasecond and the extended Chandra deep field cells supplement catalogs in 2008. Um, that kind of rebuilt the Chandra Deep Field South 2 megasecond catalog um, with some very good um, uh, new stacking analysis that was done. And then NARCS, which is the Norma Arm Region Chandra Survey, also came out of a thesis. Uh, this one surprised me. 94 or 26% of the recipients of Chandra theses have participated in at least one panel in a Chandra peer review. And I think that's, I think I can safely say that's higher than the people who have, when you take a look at all of the people who have received Chandra proposal, I think that rate's much higher uh, for serving on panels. Um, and they've served in a variety of positions, 
um, all, in every single um, part of peer review, uh, from reviewer to chair, deputy chair, and pundits. And one uh, thesis recipient has actually participated in five peer reviews. That's dedication. So um, we also, uh, they seem to be rather successful or at least prolific in writing change proposals for data um, and have a pretty reasonable acceptance rate. I can't really compare it to the acceptance rate of um, proposers in general because uh, our user's database is in flux right now, so I can't always get unique IDs for people to do the statistics with. Um, but uh, people who receive Chandra uh, theses often go on to write more proposals and get them accepted. Um, the, this third bullet, this is the person that I refer to as the most persistent. <laughs> Uh, having submitted 195 proposals <laughs> um, and a fair acceptance rate, um, but uh, this last person has is in the having submitted uh, 20 or so proposals as a PI, or sorry, uh, more than 20, and 24 of them were uh, were approved. So th this this person is one of I probably one of the more successful. Chandra proposers, I know they are. <laughs> um, I'm still working on a few things. I take a lot. It takes a lot of time to gather all the data connected to a thesis um, because uh, just because of the format that the theses are in. Um, I'm still working on whether or not the thesis recipient or the advisor were connected to the proposal slash data used in the thesis. Quite a few of them are, and I've actually found a number of instances where. The thesis student wrote their proposal for their thesis, got the proposal and the data, and were able to finish the thesis. Um, at first, I was told that would never happen, but it can. Um, and it's extremely difficult to determine if the recipients are still in astronomy um, for a whole host of reasons, disambiguating people being the, the primary one. <laughs> Um, and whether or not their, re their results in the thesis were published in refereed journals. It's just very time-consuming uh, searches. So we've done these studies and a number of others. Uh, we're asked different questions every year from the users committee and uh, every two years for the senior review. And we try to absorb the types of things that we've learned. And over the years that we've We've done a number of things. One, as I mentioned before, we link ADS and Chaser, the search tool to get into to the Chandra archive, uh, and they're cross-linked by the OBS IDs. So if you're in Chaser, you can get to ADS, and if you're in ADS, you can get back to Chaser. The, the two are linked. You, you, you've got a one-to-one -one connection there. We also have a bibliography search page, which lets you search on other pieces of metadata that we collect. Um, and that's due for an overhaul this year to add in all of the new metadata that I've been putting into the database. And uh, we currently have, um, I wrote unintentional, but that should be, no, in an intentional aggregates. The programs are designed by proposals and sequence numbers and monitoring sequences. Those are all navigable in Chandra. You may not have seen them, but when you go to the um, full description page on the left there's a menu of different things that you can look at and at the bottom you can get um, you can then navigate all of the other OBS IDs in the proposal or the sequence number or whichever one of these categories it fits into. A couple of things that we have in the works we're working on having a Twitter feed from the archive a number of them will be suggested tweets based on bibliography results and a, and a number of other things to get people to know what's in our archive and what they might be interested in. Uh, we're also working on annotating the Chandra footprints from Simbad. So we, we have footprints of all of the Chandra data and we're looking for Simbad objects that are likely also x-ray objects and having those names attached to the OBS ID so that if a person comes in and searches for blazars, maybe they'll, it's an e might be an easier quick search for, for people to do rather than putting in a list of coordinates. And then some of our longer term projects are uh, building these spatial aggregates, uh, essentially grouping observations by how close they are in the sky um, and instrument configuration. 
And then eventually exposing those to Chaser in the same way that we've done proposal numbers and sequence numbers. Um, and then also uh, we've been having a lot of discussions on how we can collect contributed data sets. So for instance, um, when a large survey is done and they've created lots of stacked images and want a permanent home for them, we're trying to figure out how we can handle that so that it stays within the astronomy community, can always be found, and if we're really lucky someday, it'll be searchable through all of the other tools as well. So, thank you. Absolutely. Um, so it comes in two flavors. One, uh, Chandra has what are called archival proposals. So every year there's a pot of money that is awarded to people who have proposals where they specifically want to analyze specific data sets already in the archive. But we're seeing more and more uh, papers out there where essentially they, they tell us, we did this query against the archive and we analyzed all the data looking for X types of, of targets. Uh, yeah. Do you know uh, what fraction of science data has never been published? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, well, the easiest way to put it, after 10 years in the archive, 80% of the data have been published at least once. Um, at this point, and uh, after, I think it's after 15 years, 90% of the data have been published. Um, and so, yes, we are wondering what didn't get published, part of our Twitter feed. <laughs> um, and I do, just was recently looking at that question for the upcoming Chandra peer review, or uh, senior review, and uh, what, there's no rhyme or reason. So there's some really good data out there that no one's ever analyzed and relative, some relatively large data sets that no one's ever analyzed. So check it out. Yes. <laughs> and in fact, um, if you look in the Chandra newsletter from 2018, I have an article on it. <laughs> um, uh, essentially, since 2013, which is where we have got the most complete statistics on it, um, 80 to 90 percent of the papers have some multi-observatory component attached to them. Uh, and of course, using, uh, combining Chandra data with the great observatories and XMM, is, is done quite frequently, in part because, at least with the great observatories, they were actually designed for that purpose. So I'd say that's a win for the great observatories, because that's exactly what everyone's doing. Um, and for XMM, they were, they were designed to be quite complementary, and as we can see, they get used in that complementary way. So yeah. Uh, but we do have a whole host of ground-based observatories in radio, in radio and, and actually in all wave bands. That was pretty much my question. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned there's some data that's never been used and some data sets that have never been analyzed. What are these data sets? Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head, um, but... Um, some of them are things like, you know, if you want to look at this and see if you can measure this, you can use them. Right, so I know, I know one relatively large data set was looking at a field in the LMC for a particular thing and their thing couldn't be seen. That doesn't mean other things aren't there. Um, and uh, so they've never published the data, um, but I've heard through the grapevine that some other people are working on it. <laughs> Maybe not the goal of the proposal, that may be an answer, but it's 
very difficult to reconstruct what was the primary goal. Right. But there's no problem with right. question, and there is nothing really wrong. And I, I'd also like to add that the reason that it wasn't published probably isn't because there's not something there. Uh, I know in several cases the astronomer retired in one way or another. Um, so that project got dropped, their interests changed, their life changed, and they've just never been able to get to it again. And this is why it's so important to us to try to figure out ways that um, link that, connect that data. We don't want to see what, what we've been calling orphan data sets hanging out there that maybe could be used for a different project, but you, we haven't provided all of the links so that when you do your queries, you know that that would be a good data set to also pick up. Oh, they're all on ADS. No, no, they're not. Well, if they're not well, in, if they're not yeah, on ADS, like, I don't find them. like in Italy, it's not very um, common to put uh, more and more. On ADS, more and like. more are the universities themselves are doing it. Really? In okay. more and more cases, yeah. Um, because, uh, as for example, I'm pretty sure you don't have the cosmos thesis there. I uh, know, I don't, because I would have listed it. <laughs> and there was, and there is a whole thesis that published. Right. That was the one. Yeah. That so. Just the cosmos yeah. Cosmos, so, so if it's not an ADS, and the beauty of ADS is and that, that you, as the thesis recipient, can actually submit it to ADS, mm -hmm. um, and then I'll pick it up. Okay. Well. <laughs> yes, I don't. I don't. I don't think that everyone really wants to put their thesis uh, on ADS, or maybe there are some. Well, you know, it's surprising. Uh, so I've been looking at. You know, people are reading theses more and more. I mean, okay. other people are reading okay. theses more and more. Um, and I'm pretty sure I did both my master and my PhD thesis on Chandra data. Oh, good. Then I can raise and that so, number to two. <laughs> yes, you can put that number to two. <laughs> so it's like. Yeah, that would be like yeah, yeah. And I didn't put my thesis yeah. on. Oh, the other, the other, the so other reason I sometimes miss is um, if Chandra or X-ray is not in the title ab or abstract, I don't initially pick it up. Mm -hmm. okay. That's my first broad search of ADS, okay. and then after that, I go and download all the papers. And did you ever send us emails about the uh, hey? Did because I remember getting like, um, I know your thesis. Uh, CDO, tell us, uh, CDO if, yes. has done that. And, and I'm pretty sure I, I reply to on, that like, yes, yeah. this guy. So with I, re his I rely on CDO to do that oh, and, mm -hmm. to, and to kind of push people to do it. Um, I think I replied saying, hey, this thesis was, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. this, this data that. Yeah, I know your thesis, thesis is, isn't. Rudy's thesis is in my list, but I know yours isn't. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send you an email then. <laughs> All right. <laughs> If somebody uh, refers to Chandra data and never actually goes to the archive and paper, will you know about it? Um, you may refer to a Chandra paper or something. I actually have started putting those links in my database as well. I don't expose it to ADS, but I have it in my database. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another question. Uh, have you ever looked into what HST does to see if... Yeah, they hate, they don't they don't like me because <laughs> I'm way I'm I'm way past whatever they do. <laughs> and they're like, you have made us do all these statistics that we didn't want to do because we link data much more carefully than they do. So um, and they have a different architecture. I I as being in the archive, I literally have access to the entire mission from proposal to. So you don't have much to learn from them. No, they yeah, have a lot to learn from me. I am, I am. So, yeah. No, we do collaborate. Um, there, there's Bibliography Curators is a small group of people, and we all know each other. <laughs> and just one we other remark. If you want flashier slides, why don't you just use your quills? And I, I'm not about it. <laughs> you can use all citation graphs, too. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm instead I'm, of whatever. I had I brought my own lunch. Right. <laughs> but then, okay, I'm going to bring it over to the head lounge. Okay. <laughs> my name is Sarah Price. It's great to meet you. Hi. Sherry. Hi. Hi. I, the name's familiar. Why yes. is the name familiar? Because I work with Martin Elvis and Daniel Castro to 
do work on multi wavelength okay. citations. So I use okay. a lot of the work okay. I've done with okay. um, ADS and chaser length, mm -hmm. and then the mm -hmm. OBS ideas mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. a big factor. Yeah. And it was really helpful that you talked about to distinguish between just a high number of citations and what is really useful and high impact. So right now, we submitted to the Decadal Survey a science white paper on the importance of um, multi wavelength astrophysics to the next generation. And we are going to submit another white paper to the projects part of okay. the survey. So it would be great to be able to meet with you yeah. and talk about that. So yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So I will email you so we can set up uh, some sort of great. time on our schedules. I'm yeah. usually available on weekdays sort of before 1 p.m. or so. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm around. I have to keep the archive going. <laughs> you. you probably saw my name in connection with some of that work. Yeah, maybe, maybe. And it was funny, just be, earlier today after the announcement came out, Martin sent me an email saying, sorry, can't make it, but here's an interesting article on science impact. You may be interested. Yeah, he had sent me um, the newsletter piece about oh, okay. different multiple yeah. because he said maybe it would be a good idea to talk to Sherry yeah. about research that we're doing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, and, and if, if we can provide numbers, we'd love to. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so yeah. much. Sure. Yeah, I'm hoping that this <laughs> helps to make a new panchromatic Oh, you know, I should have I should have so put that down in the why should you care. Exactly. The decadal, I never, I've been to several workshops.